Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partner in soccer, two-man show, give and go, David Goss. What's up, Dave? It's been a while. I've listened to some two-man shows, but I haven't participated wow. in a two-man show. Are you going to be able to fill the time? That's an open question. Give me a list of your best attributes to fill uh, the time. Well, first of all, I am a little bit under the weather, so that ought to help me. So this in, is your flu game. Yeah, this is my flu game. That's yeah. right. And then I will play my flu game on Monday when you give me the flu today. To be fair, you I texted you last yeah. night. I said, hey, look, I've had a little bit of a cold. I don't want to expose you. Yeah. I don't want to put you into my world with two small children just collecting every germ. And I was at the time drinking a Cafe de Oya cocktail, and I was like, let's just live life, baby. What is that? Yeah. What, Maria like what, that. What is that? <laughs> Cafe de Oya is like a Mexican coffee. It's called Coffee of the Pot. So you brew the coffee in a giant pot with a bunch of spices. So it has a ton of flavors. So it's normally just coffee. But then this place I was at used it instead of pretty much espresso as like a cocktail. And it was delicious. This is a... I love Cafe de Oya. And it's really hard to find in New York. And I don't speak Spanish. So when I go into mainly Mexican restaurants, and I ask if they have it, they always say yes, and then they just serve me coffee. They're juiced. Oh, no, they're like, oh, he won't know. Yeah, yeah. Like, they don't make it, because right, right. it's like not a thing everyone makes. Yeah, they're and like, they're go like, back to the, go to the kitchen, they're like, yeah. And they're like, here's coffee. Wink, 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 this yeah. is what he wants. Yeah. yeah. This is a lesson in the uh, dichotomy between our lives. You out and about drinking special cocktails, me hoovering up viruses at home with two small children. Uh, we got a great show for you. It's a mailbag show. We're going to go all over the park on this one. We're going to start with Quakes2023, who I think was uh, very sincere <laughs> when he tweeted us. Come up with 10 to 15 unnecessary stories about Messi and continue ignoring the team still competing in the playoffs. Now, this is strange because this is a Quakes fan. His team's not even in the playoffs. Right. And he's still trying to troll us about Messi. I think in fairness, we haven't really talked about Luis Suarez. No, we haven't. Which is like to our credit. Should we do it? Yeah, let's just do a show about Luis. Suarez. How many? How many? I tried to do it on a previous show. I said, "How many goals is he going to score?" Let I me think just he's going to score an insane amount of goals. Let me just look real quick because I think he just scored like a hat yes. trick last weekend. So I just want to see his number in Brazil. The the line for Luis Suarez. Of so like, he's got seven goals yeah. in twelve league games Decent. for Grêmio. Where he's like, "Oh, my knee is probably not going to allow me to continue to play for very much longer." And then he's like, "Oh, well, I'm going to score hat tricks and go to Miami." I think his knee is probably okay. He's he's muddling along quite nicely. Yeah, he's got nine goals this year in 14 games, and one of the cup games was against the first division team as well. So the quality is not lacking. No. So I'll say the over-under for next year for him in MLS competition. MLS only, correct. Is 10 and a half. Oh, I'm smashing the You think that's too low? Smashing But my ball. thing is, if if you think he's going to score in like a once every two games rate... How many games do you think he plays in MLS? Yeah, probably starts starts somewhere between 18 and 22. So that would give you... Because you have Leo Campana. I don't know. They can play two forwards. But if you have Leo Campana, you have a natural fill-in. You don't want to overdo it. You also as far have as. CONCACAF Champions Cup. You have, you have League's Cup, Cup which they are, the reigning, title. they are the reigning title. title. Yeah. yeah, You've got Open Cup. Mm -hmm. um, which, so I, I mean, that's why it's coming. And I don't know anything, but like... There's like all these rumors about international tours and whatever. It feels like Miami will play additional games okay, on top of so things. If I set so in MLS play, I assume he will appear about 22 times. I'm trying to think of a number that will get you to say under. Okay. Like right on the line here. If I set it at 14 and a half, yeah, would you go? That would, that's probably the line that, I, that makes me uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah. I mean, either way, double digits, I feel like is a shoe in. Yeah. I mean, just oh, give him, well, a, give him like a ten and a half. Give him a couple games against Toronto FC. You know what I mean? Like he he will go get three goals a game with Messi against uh, some bad teams. I want to see who he did just score a hat trick against. We are ignoring the playoffs, by the way. Saturday, November twenty fifth. Right. Sunday, November twenty sixth. The doubleheader on both days. Orlando, Columbus on oh, Saturday. We got another gets week. Started. Yeah, yeah, we got time. Cincinnati, Philadelphia. I'm just reminding the people at home. Those evenings are already accounted. Which of those games is Luis Suarez going to play in? He's watching them both, if I know Whoa. Luis Suarez. It's MLS season pass worldwide. Yeah, in Brazil. Watch it. Just got to have this. In Uruguay, watch it. No doubt. Doesn't Houston, matter. Kansas City, Seattle, LFC on Sunday. We will do a full preview show next Monday leading into those games because we'll be off over that Thanksgiving Day period. So we'll just have one show next week. It'll be all about the playoff games. All right. 
We've done enough Leo Messi related material here. Well, we only did one theme. You have 14 more if you want. I don't have them. Joseph Font, hit us up. <laughs> New England Revolution, stadium vote for Everett Mass. We're doing it again, baby. We're back. A Rev Stadium in proximity to the T and Dunkin' Donuts. It's everything you dreamed of. You think it's going to get done? I hope. What am I supposed to say? Yeah, I don't know. Nothing. It is where they just recently built a casino, so there's been a bit of movement to redevelop the area and obviously bring in some new stuff. Um, but as you said, there has been 14 sites and 14 rumors, and we've gone deep down them. This one feels realistic, but so did Wonderland. So did Revere. So did the World Trade Center area. Like There have been all of these, and they all felt realistic, and none of them happened. Well, let's get it done. How close is it to the T? You know, I'm just, you're the only I think, person I know that knows. Yeah, I think anyway. someone said it. I don't know the exact site, but I know obviously one, the T runs to Everett Mass. And two, I think someone said it was like within a mile walk. That's not bad. No, not at all. Yeah. I think it's this, a mile walk this, from this, the path station to. Does it just uh, me as it sound like they're elephants above our yeah, head? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. It's probably Diego Valeri just juggling. I don't know what's going on. Um, It would. People jumping Listen, I, I have said on this show every time it comes up. If the Rebs put a stadium in Boston proper that you can access by public transportation, it will sell out every single game and it will change the perception of them in this league and I think globally. We're talking about a city that has over 60 colleges and students from around the world who love the sport already, plus a great soccer culture in New England of locals and the Rebs get fans. So you have the already twelve to 35,000 that go to Foxborough and then you add in people in the city who would like to go that don't have cars or aren't going to commute out. And you put it in a legitimate stadium, what we saw Nashville build. And you go to players around the world and you're like, do you want to play in this? And I think everyone would say yes. 25,000 is the number in the documents that have been filed that are being voted on by the local government, et cetera. I, I'm no expert when it comes to any of those things so i'm gonna leave that and let it lie and the folks in new england can tell you about it but we just hope it gets done because it would be awesome as you said award season is here matt miazga is your defender of the year uh victor rivas is your referee of the year that time um, that goes together in one we way or another together. yeah alan polito is your comeback player of the year and ian mckay congratulations is the assistant referee of the year for 2023 what did Who you vote comeback player polito okay yeah out for a full year came back i thought in his moments was the best number nine in mls you know for long stretches throughout the year and uh didn't know if he was ever going to do that or play sustained minutes in major league soccer so for me he was the guy but there were some good good candidates in that one he i was, vote i just i voted keaton parks and it's one of those things uh, where it's like yeah. this award is a fake award and you're judging what but it just felt like he came back from something, something that was bigger you didn't know and he was a full-time player this year either way happy for a lot of the players on that list who's the etr host of the year wow is that a question yeah it was framed as one um it's a tough question it's an interesting one i will go out there and say i think the way tom elevated into being a consistent strong host oh i like that i thought there was room for growth there and he took it yeah he went and he went from you know he went from you know just scoops, just like a side character. To he hosted, he actually hosted some. Yeah, shout out to St Stefano as well, and Kalen, and yeah. Kalen. I, and, yo, wow, yeah. To Kalen, I would give it to Kalen with a C. Oh, interesting. Because I think he elevated outside of the yeah. pod. In fact, we've missed him this year. Yeah, I was gonna say he's stepped off. Right to step. He's up. a high volume shooter when he's right, on right. the court. Yeah, but he's not playing that often. Now we now we just listen to him on games. Yeah. So I would have given it to him, but okay. you can let us know. Hit us up on Twitter. Nick says we owe them a postmortem on Atlanta. Them being Atlanta fans, or I, I, I don't know who else, but we do owe them that. We forgot to do it on the last show. Oh. Ja said finish up the Atlanta segment. We just we didn't get that one done. We so thought do maybe we would have guests on to talk about it, and they chose not to, Correct. so we don't. So now we're the guests. We are. You want to interview me? Tiago Amada, when does he get sold? So this is the key, the key cog in all of this, I think. Yeah. Like the stumbling block, the domino, when it falls, how it falls, will determine a lot of other things. Atlanta says they'd like to wait till next summer. That feels like the best time. But Tiago Amada feels like he wants to go, so you've probably got to give him a good indication that it's going to be the sort of place that he wants to go and that the interest is not only going to be real in the winter, because it certainly is, 
maybe at the, not at the price point and the, yeah, the breadth of teams that Atlanta wants. That's the tough part. So you got you to gotta find a way to get him to the summer. Well, I, I, I wonder if the argument for the summer is you made a World Cup roster playing here. You can make a Copa America roster playing here because that's the big story next summer is Copa America is here. So I think that's an opportunity to say, you know, don't go and try and find your spot in a new team next January and then be iffy going into that roster selection. Play here. Play at your highest level. Be comfortable here already. We, we saw what happened for Velasco playing here as well. Like there's, there's Argentine focus on this league. I don't know if you've heard. I have. So I think that's your argument for him. And I think you have the conversation of like at the number we want for you and you want for yourself and the options you want and the team you want, the summer will probably be better for everyone. I, I don't know that it will 100% be better for Atlanta. But that was always the issue for Atlanta, right? And is that he was going to be sold at some point. Yeah. So you just have to manage the timing in terms of all the other pieces moving around you. And the thing that you can sell Tiago on is this team is much better mm-hmm. now than it was when you were thriving at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Like, it is much better. You have more talent around you. You'll have more talent after this winter transfer window because even if they don't, you know, let's say we're not selling you, center back, central midfield, obvious places to reinforce – They'll have to because it looks like Miles Robinson is Yeah, I was going to say the center back one, I don't know that they will reinforce or be better, but they will have to make. They'll have to add. Yeah. There will be subtraction, you you assume, unless Robinson becomes a DM or he softens his stance on what he wants as far as a contract goes. Huh? You said Robinson becomes a DM. Oh, DP, my bad. I was like, oh, if he changes position, a defensive midfielder would him. also be a, a positive. I yeah, my my guess will be that's the big upgrade this off season is a replacement for Rosetto and obviously Ibarra. Before you've brought Santiago in Mujumba, is he? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. If how Santiago do you move Sosa off that? Counts as a person. Yeah, how do you move off that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's the big change for this team. And yeah, the argument for him is like, Jean de Silva's on loan. We understand that the option is already the number is already set. So they just have to trigger it. My guess would be you would after seeing the success he had with this team. I thought Saba Lobachanitsa was good in spots this season. I don't think he was good enough to cover for an Almada being out, but also that's year one. And there's people that have theorems about players getting better and players getting more comfortable. I don't know that he is an Almada, right? Like he's not, it's not positionally. Well, like, Almada like, is just quality. Just level, impact. You're yeah. Saying. yeah. Okay. Like if you don't have Almada, and it's Yakumakis and him, and there's a DP spot open, or Almada's not playing, or whatever. This team, I don't think, has a star that they play through. And so... Well, I think the playoffs probably proved that. Exactly. So you, so maybe Lobachinista takes a step forward, and the way he was signed, like the number he's at, there is an assumption that he will be close to that level from a guy in Garth Lagerway who has done this before with other players. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they handle the offseason. This was obviously an issue for Miami in the other direction last year. Like they didn't have a player to fill the Messi role before Messi got there. Can they find a player who can help on the Almada side after he leaves or while he's leaving? Um, I'll bring up Alejandro Pozuelo every day because I think everyone should sign him. That's MLS related. I'm have to look he's, in, the- he's in Dubai. Oh, that yeah. Well. That makes sense. We hung out when we went. Yeah, that makes sense. Not at all. Free agents we looked at for the central midfield position. Kellen Acosta is going to be a free agent. Derek Jones had to get him in. Alex Ring. Junior Moreno is going to be a free agent. Ali Bedoya and Dax McCarty. Any of those jump out to you? Definitely Kellen. And Garth has a history of leaning on players who have played in MLS before. When you look at the Seattle roster build, when you look at the moves he makes in Seattle, a lot of times he leans into experience in this league outside of the DP contracts, and then also with Albert Rusnak and that acquisition of getting to the next level. So I think Kellen's really interesting. He played a little bit less this year at LAFC. So whether that was fitness or health, or he has talked about leaving. Now, he has talked about going to Europe. Um, At his age, there's not normally teams that are going to sign you at your first opportunity to like get comfortable in Europe at that age, and there's not really a sell-on factor. So he would be the big one that stands out. I think the other ones you named are all, a lot of them would make Atlanta a better team. I don't think they'd want to go into the year with them as a starter next to Muyumba. Maybe Dax. I, I think Junior Moreno, you might. I don't know about that. Nobodo is 
arguably the best player in the league. Lucho is at his position. Lucho is arguably the best player in the league at his position. I like Junior Moreno on Cincinnati. I don't know that he's the guy okay. you come out of this year saying, yeah, that's going to take Atlanta That's going to level us level. up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question about Gonzalo Pineda. He's sticking around, yeah? He did enough. Yeah, I, think so. I think so. Yeah. I think so. We'll see what it means in the future, but uh, he said in his post-game or post-season, whatever you want to call it, press conference, basically there's another level that they have to reach. Uh, finding a way to thread the, the needles with all the moving parts is going to be the challenge with Robinson going, and it seems like Almada's future in somewhat of a uh, TBD. So what's the best case scenario for next year? Let's try to walk through that. It is you keep Almada till the summer for sure. When do you sign the Almada replacement? You probably have to do it after Almada's gone in the summer because of the DP spot. So yeah. what does that mean for MLS Cup hopes throughout yeah. the course of the year? I think it's you try and stack points early in the year when you have Almada to have a comfortable spot in the playoffs so that when you bring in that summer acquisition, you then have a little wiggle room to play with things and figure it out on the fly without points being as critical so that you are hitting the playoffs at your highest form. The hope would be you improve the center back goalkeeper position and central midfield position. So you have more balance as a team. That was the issue this year. It was like, they could score goals. There was no balance to the mm -hmm. team. And even with the quality of individuals that they have in the goal scoring positions, they still had to push Brooks Lennon and Caleb Wiley into the attack to be really effective and then that opened them up even worse with the deficiencies they had, which is I thought Luis Abram struggled a lot this year, 1v1 defending. Before Mayumba came in, they were completely open in midfield. And I think Brad Guzan at 39 years old is not a match winner in Major League Soccer anymore. So if you can improve those spots the way you would expect this Atlanta team to recognize, okay, here's the offseason plan, you probably have some wiggle room around Almada of – Everything else is settled. Everything else works. We can grind out some results while we get the next person in and figure it out. What will be interesting is the profile, right? They went from Almiron to PT, which was PT is going to be here. He's 26, former South American player. He's going to be here. He's going to fit in immediately. That didn't work. They also have tried the Barco method. Yeah, the Barco method. And Almiron was a little bit in between. 22, had already left his home country, had gone overseas, had sort of had that experience and then came here. So I think it'll be interesting. What's the profile of the player? Cause with Saba, you assume he's here for the long term. Saba and, and Yakumakis are both in that profile that Garth yeah. Lagerway has talked about repeatedly, which Rui Diaz and Ladero fell into and Rusnak as well of like proven commodity has moved outside their home country, has settled in big clubs elsewhere can come in, settle immediately and lead us and be a cornerstone around which to place the pieces like an Almada or, you know, young, like a Caleb Wiley to level up younger players. So the one I would add, though, is, but then you have to talk about sell-on. And I don't know that Saba was brought in with the idea of sell-on. Yakumakis, you could sort could of see that. it in that he's moved a lot. He's moved enough that there's probably another move in there for him. And then the question is this Almada replacement. Do you want it to be a talent buy that you're going to reset the transfer record on? after Almiron, after Almada for the next one? Or are you looking at a player that you want to be there long-term and build a winner around and be established, especially when there's rumors on more spots being opened and the under-22 initiative being a space where Atlanta could probably spend some money and have some talent that they can develop and sell without it being the DP. No inside information, no nothing, but just pure Tommy Scoops vibes here. I think if I was Atlanta, I would go for the established player that was going to win me trophies and be around for three, four, five years, ideally, in the Nico Ladero mold and try to get back to the cup contender, cup favorite ways of old in the moment that soccer in this country around the World Cup in 2026 mm. is hitting a launching pad. Yeah, I just think that Atlanta United fans got so accustomed early to that feeling and the stadium and the vibes and the way they thought about their club was not about, Hey, we sold Almiron for 27 million. It was about Almiron and Joseph doing the dragon ball Z celebration and winning trophies yeah. in the state that it wasn't about, Hey, we're a, they don't want to be like oh, Atlanta United is a selling club. Look how much we sold. They Almiron. did though. They did though. They did. They it, leaned into that, and that seemed to be sure, a point of pride but I think, I for think, someone associated with I get it, club. but I think in terms of as a means to the end of winning that championship, 
And then it was like, okay, cool, go on your own. But Joseph Martinez, you're not that guy. You're going to stay here and be our dude. I, I think they, you have to find a way to marry it. And that's where the U22 slots come in, where it's like, hey, Atlanta, Arthur Blank, Garth Lagerwey, you guys still have money to go play with. It's not like you can't go spend big-time transfer fees on players. You can still do that. Oh, and by the way, now you can blood them into your squad with three designated players that can help you win right now. And the expectation is that you will win right now. Garth Lagerwey didn't come in to run Atlanta United to be like, I sold a lot of players for a lot of money. He came in to say, I'm doing it all, right? Yeah. To, to, do, to do the selling side, and maybe Caleb Wiley's that next guy, and, you know. But it ultimately, it's about winning. Well, that's the one piece I would throw in is, I think it's fair to make the argument that you could or should start producing the, sell, the players that you're going to sell, and so you don't have to lean on the DP spot because you're Atlanta, and, like, the southeast outside of Miami and Orlando – you have an opportunity to draw players from, and it's a great soccer area. And Wiley will be the next one. Bello already happened. They have a short history of it, but they've invested as much in their academy as any team in Major League Soccer. The facilities at the training center, you've been. Like, it is top-notch. The mm -hmm. things they do for their players at those ages is top-notch. The way they've invested in that. So I think it's fair to make the argument, let's say you are, Garth, making the argument too, Arthur Blank and, and your leadership group above you, which I don't think he has to because I think him being brought in was like, he made the argument and they said, your plan is what we're going with. So whatever. Yeah. Ambition, do, ambition has never been like, Oh, Hey, Arthur Blank, you got to be ambitious. He's right. like, yeah, bro. Look around. Yeah. So I think that is a fair point to make of like, we can develop future quote unquote Almiron. And that's, that that's moment. where the ROI is, right? Like if you're thinking about selling a player, whether it's return on investment, dollar for dollar or on TAM or on whatever else or on, you know, maximizing your roster while also doing the selling part. DPs are not the way to do it. No, dude, like it's, rock, the, it's Rocket Retorita. Yeah, with the... Let's uh, go. With, you know, Rocket Retorita. Let's oh go. With, with the acquisition costs, with the salary costs, like that's a harder player to sell than is a homegrown or is a U22. It depends on the fee there as well, but like less salary, looking for another big deal, less of a transfer fee. Like the ROI is not... I don't know. I think we're going to shift here where it's like, hey, DPs are there to win. DPs are there to elevate your entire roster to a certain level. The reason we created U22s, the reason you have homegrowns, is so that you can bring players through that have the age profile, the upside profile. And now you would hope through sales to Europe and then MLS players performing in that environment, like a market that can start to – yeah. The the Provide argument, returns, real returns. An argument I would make, uh, not against that, but is just, no matter what we're talking about, you reach a certain investment and things start to become less true where like Almada, they spent so much on Almada that he is a legitimate game winning DP right 100%, now. Yeah. So that's where they could shift that a little bit of like, yeah, Fair. you're talking about the Nico Laderos. You're talking about the Robbie Keens in the past. You're talking about Lucho Acosta now, right? We're but gonna, like, we'll go get the best young player in if, Argentina. If we're going to spend $25 million on the next Argentine right. number 10, then like, yeah. we're going to win now and later. <laughs> and that's sort of what Orlando said with Facu Torres. Yeah. Now, Orlando then, I thought, put around Facu Torres, and they're a better team this year. Players with a little bit less experience where Atlanta has gone with Yakumakis and um, Saba, which is their plan, which is what. Seattle did as well. So it'll be interesting. It will be, I think. Do you have confidence that Atlanta is going to be a team that is going to lead next year? Whatever you take that word as. Lead? They're going to be one of the front runners in MLS over the course of the season, whether in multiple competitions, whether for MLS Cup, for Supporter Shield. Like, do you think they will turn back the clock? And it will be not the conversation we've had for the last four years, which is flashes, and it will be a full season of consistency. Nah, it feels like a flashes season to me. Yeah, me too. It doesn't feel like a in the shield conversation. It, it it feels like another season of feels like a transitionary season because Almada is going to go, no doubt about it. And center back and central midfield and goalkeeper now. Question marks. Like they have enough talent. They have the ability to be a MLS Cup contender. I just don't think we're going to be sitting there saying all year long Cincinnati, you know, revs in their 73-point season. Like, look at them just hold a level. That doesn't seem realistic to me. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the playoffs real quick. 
I had an email here from, or no, a tweet from Will Hughes said, has Cincy lost their favorite status for MLS Cup? miazga has gone for who knows how long. Aaron Bupenza's antics continue. If you didn't notice, he was kicked off the Gabon national team uh, in this transfer window for being late. Apparently, Libreville was calling his name. I don't know. That's pure speculation, but he, he was supposed to show up, and Gabon said he didn't, so they said, you're good. We don't need you this which is the which inverse window? of what he did coming into decision day, which was returning too late from Gabon to Cincinnati yeah. and Cincinnati suspended. And look, people have personal situations. I have no idea what Aaron Bupenza's personal life is. So there may be some extenuating circumstance in here that is very explainable and understandable, but there is a little bit of a pattern. So I'm going to rank who I think is most likely to win MLS Cup right now. You can pick it apart and argue with me and call me a dummy. Okay. Number one. Seattle Sounders. Number one? Number one. The number one? Number one. Okay, so the, the point against Seattle, or the argument against Seattle, is they are probably playing the best team in this round. So they are home, but yes. LAFC is probably the best away team in this round of the, of the postseason. Correct. Dennis Buanga is probably the best player on the field in that game, which is a winning model, plus... LAFC won MLS Cup last year. They're playing with a little bit of experience. So the argument against Seattle is that. That's the argument. And they will have to travel for MLS Cup no matter what. Yeah. So they will play the toughest team at home. Then if they win, they are guaranteed to host the Western Conference Finals. And then they will have to travel for MLS Cup. That is a really tough road when you talk about trying to get from this get point it. to the final. I get it. I don't think there's an obvious number one anymore because Cincinnati yeah. get Philly and Philly is banged up, obviously missing two of their best players on the back line. Julian Carranza has returned to training, but they don't have Matt Miazga and they've been playing on razor thin margins all year and haven't been as reliably. I just haven't been as reliable for the second half of the season as they were for the first. Okay. But could easily run through this at home and be all good. So, so I probably should have had them number one. I think, you, I think thing, you should should still. Now, the gap closed me. a lot between, I think, if Miazga was playing and Wobodo was fully healthy. Yeah. And I wouldn't have any questions. It they would, be would, it would be them and then Big a gap. pack that was really close. Yep. Now it's all a pack that's really close. So I think that's fair. Do you have Cincy two? Since he's two. Okay. Yeah. And look, the Seattle one's an experience play. I'm just like, hey, been there, done that. And they're and they're home against LAFC. So they are yeah. favorites against LAFC right. because they're home. Orlando is three for me. And Interesting. That's, that's just on home field advantage. LAFC is four. Yeah. Because the assumption is one, Orlando plays Columbus at home. And then two, if you're questioning Cincy, there's a good chance they play the second game. Correct. They play the Eastern Conference Finals at home. They would host all the way through. And I think Orlando's perfectly comfortable going to Cincinnati and Playing like a pure, yeah, they did it at the yeah, end of the season, like a day. pure road, a road team of like, cool, you guys carry the game, we'll just wait our our moment, we don't give up chances. Yeah, I. Th Those four are the top four for me, and it's it's really it like, LAFC. LAFC, shuffle the deck, put it out there, and then Columbus, I can see sneaking into it, and then Philly, Houston, and Kansas City, I have like down a tier. In what order? Philly, Houston, and Kansas City. Okay. I have Kansas City last. They got to go on the road the whole way. Yeah. That's tough. I think that's right. Um, I think, I think Houston's interesting. I think they're massive favorites against SKC at home. I know no one else agrees with me, but like, I think massive? losing in Debe is massive. I don't know the status of Rosero. I'm not saying he's not going to play. I just don't know. And this is a KC team that was weak most of the year. And I get that they played well against St. Louis. They sat in and took less possession at St. Louis. They scored, as I've said multiple times. The only three goals from outside the box all season in Major League Soccer. They had like a 0.4 XG. No, sorry, 0.16 XG when the third goal hit the back of the net. And St. Louis were maybe the worst possession team left in the playoffs. So Houston, you can't play that way. You're going to have to be more open, or I think they're going to pull you apart. There is a massive difference in the quality of central midfield. Yeah. Now, Houston will have to go no matter what and travel for the Western Conference Finals. And I think against the top echelon, people don't feel as strongly about them. So I get that. Um, yeah, it, I think it's really tough. Like, you could have argued any team here, and I wouldn't have thought you were being ridiculous, which is fun, and I think it's part of what we got, which is only one upset in the last round, and it was the one team that came in on form. You feel pretty even about most of these matchups. I'm, I'm a little bit regretful now of, am I, am I under... Am I underestimating Cincinnati? Am I overestimating the Matt Miazga's presence? No, not at all. He is the defender of the year for a reason. They are also missing Nick Hagelin. 
So in a team that plays with three center backs, they do not have three healthy center backs on their roster going into a playoff game. And if Carranza is healthy, That's you are talking about an Eastern Conference reigning champions, a CCL semifinalist, a team that has been here before and has the right pieces and style to take advantage of Cincinnati. But who teams. also have issues on their back line. Yeah, I don't worry about glessness as much right now like i think you don't think the exact same issues that cincinnati could have with two forwards and the movement of carranza and ua would be the exact same issue that philly would have with vasquez bupenza assuming that is okay and everything gets handled there and lucho no i with barrial on the left side and probably who what in now because harry has to play the left because no wagner yeah i do not worry about it in the same way and that I don't think Philly's taking as big a step back from who they would be in this matchup anyway because Glessness is unavailable. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Well, we'll dig into it more on Monday. Red Bull's clean house. Ton of mail on this one. Joseph Fan said, why do teams wait to fire their temporary coaches until after ETR reports them safe to keep nice. their job? Did they forget they were on the payroll like the dude from Office Space? Troy Lassane is out with the Red Bulls. I Take the L on this one. I fully assumed that Troy Lissane was going to get this job. It seemed pretty safe. The players liked him. The results were at least decent. He pushed him into the playoffs. They seemed to have invested institutionally in Troy Lissane. But no. Schneider said, the head of sport for Red Bull said, nope, uh, we made a different decision. Mario Gomez, I think, is their football side. Nope. He came and visited a few weeks ago, decided that this was not the route they wanted to take. Dennis Hamlet is also out. Hamlet's been there for almost a decade, I think since 2015. Wow. I assume Frank Klopas was the interim manager that wasn't going to get the job. And now it seems like that's flipped. We'll talk about the fire and whatever the heck's going on there in a second. What do you make of this big time move for the Red Bulls? Because they're cleaning house. Should I read the quotes first and let you follow? Sure. Or? Okay. Schneider said they've discussed it the last few weeks in the last few days with Mario Gomez. Uh, the question was, what are we going to do to take the next step to reach the next level for this club? We decided to do this reset to start to write a new chapter and bring in new people with new ideas, new energy, different thoughts. That's the reason why we made this decision. I'm reading like four news there. And then he said, we agreed with Red Bull Soccer to invest in our team. We want to reach the next level with our club. With that said, we are resetting on the sporting side, and we felt that was the right decision. I think one of the keys in any setup with you have head of sporting and the people below them is that they share the same soccer mind. And if Joachim Schneider over the course of this year, didn't feel that way about Troy Lassane, it wasn't the right path forward. Whether Troy Lassane is a good coach or not, yeah. whether he deserves a job or not, and we can bring him up in now every other opening or a lot of the other openings. Cause he, I think he deserves it. If it's not the person that Schneider shares that soccer brain with and is going to build this project with, it's his role. And you had a little bit of an opening because he was an interim. So you weren't technically saying we're firing a coach. It was, we have an opening. It is now an opening and we're going to pursue the person we want, which with the rumors coming out, um, it's uh, Sandra Schwartz. Yeah. Who, 45-year-old German, uh, played at Mines. Under coached, club. No, played with Klopp, I think. Uh, yeah, then I think coach. He coached Mines. He's coached Hertha over the last few years. He coached in Russia as well in the middle I think of COVID. He play, I think he played for Klopp, but I could be wrong. Oh, I thought he played with him. Okay, either way. Maybe um, It is a coach with probably a higher profile than what Struber was. And it does feel like it's following the, we are going to invest and try and build this team a little bit stronger. And it comes on the side of, what we are hearing, which is that Emil Forsberg will be joining the team as well. So I think they are showing the steps that Schneider is talking about, which is elevating the club. And at this moment, if you don't believe Troy Lissane is the guy to, to, to carry that through, then you don't stick with it. And I, I think that's fair. And I think that's fine. I think it's fine to say, even with him dealing with being an interim, Making eighth in the East was not enough for us. Like, it wasn't a good enough year. And and Troy Lissane said that at the end of the year, too. I mean, he came out and said, this is not good enough for this organization. And I, I thought they played some really good soccer in the playoffs. The, the big mistakes are what killed them. They could never fix that over the course of the three or four weeks in which they got 
from, oh, we're out. Because remember, we thought they were eliminated. Yeah. Then they snuck their way back in by crushing DC United. They were able to get over the line by getting the PK on decision day just to get in the playoffs. Then they get Charlotte. And then I thought the two games in, against Cincinnati, they weren't broken down. They weren't opened up. And they made massive mistakes in both games. Andres Reyes, a lot of that, who will probably be back as a starter. Um, and so Charlie Sane wasn't able to fix those. And I think that's tough. But I understand using this moment to say, if we're turning the page, then we're going in this direction. Lesane's history, and we said it when he when he was the interim, didn't suggest that he was like a disciple of yeah. the Red Bulls way. Except he was sort that of they come, went out and got him. I, that's, that's the, the part I, that's I, hard. I know, I know. And maybe that was like, hey, we'll see if this is gonna work for you. We'll see it if feels, this can fit. I mean, wasn't wasn't it sort of like that with Jesse Marsh in a sense? It feels tough to think. And Troy Jesse Lissane Marsh became left, a disciple. It feels tough to think that Troy Lesane left the project at New Mexico with the conversation of let's see how this works. Well, he got his chance, right? But like, it felt like he was brought in to be groomed to be the guy, and maybe Struber left earlier than expected, and that's yeah. part of the problem. Or maybe the failure of Struber over the last year, changed Red Bull Global's perception of where the club stands and what needs to be done. And that could then change what we think Troy Lesane could be the guy to run this project. Schneider also said when he visited, he saw a sign in the South Ward that said, this is not good enough. And he, he sort of intimated that at the time he was frustrated by that message, but then came around to the idea that that was spot on. And Listen, maybe he just thought, maybe he just thought, look, he, they talked about new, restart, refresh. Maybe they just decided, hey, we've been sort of on this continuous path, and Lesane was a part of the Struber era of the club and that continuation, and it didn't work. Dennis Hamlet wasn't working for us. Let's just like let's put a line in the sand. Let's let's have a demarcation zone of like that was then, this is now, this is new. Even just to to send a message to the fan base, to do a reset internally within Red Bull, maybe they just had to say we can't we can't carry anything over here. Yeah. So I think that if it ends with this, it's not enough. Like, it doesn't matter. And if I'm Troy Lesane and I turn on a game next year and Emil Forsberg and Lewis Morgan are starting alongside Lukinius for this team, I'll be pissed. Because I'll be like, yeah, I could play better too. My teams would play better too if I had the two best players on the field available to me, including a player in Emil Forsberg that the team has not signed in 10 years of that quality. So I think it's fair for like Troy Lesane to have gotten the raw end of this, but also understanding what you're saying of like, okay, we're going to reset things. We're going to change things. This is what we're going to do it with. Now what's interesting is one of the things we talk about a lot. is like MLS experience. There is none in Red Bull now. And you go from a team that like leans on their homegrowns and leans on some MLS experience to Dennis Hamlet's out. Troy Lesane's out. out there then. Schneider said he's looking for MLS experience from a sporting director. He needs Someone it. who may have performed a similar role at number twos or chief scouts. Yeah. He needs it. Anybody out there? And I'm thinking maybe even from like the, is there a Cincinnati person? Is there a red, uh, a Philly person? Is there someone out there that they could go snatch this from that would fit the way that they want to model their game? Yeah. I think the next one up at Philly would be John Shear, who's a local and he's their head of scouting. That would make sense as they play a high pressing system. They have the same experience, so it would make sense as a move if that's the direction they chose to go. I think Cincinnati's a little bit tougher because it's newer and you're not sure how established people are. I think Columbus is always one that I bring up because Tim Bezbachenko, I think, does as well as anyone to help facilitate the prog professional growth of the people under him. So Issa Tall and Corey Ray are always people that I bring up. And I think when you look at Columbus and the way they've Hunter developed. Hunter Freeman is the TD at, at Cincinnati. Who was there before yeah. Chris Albright got there, but, but has, has Red Bull Red experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I think when you look at Columbus, the way they've built their pipeline, it has a lot of the fundamentals of what Red Bulls want. So I think all of those make a ton of sense. Is Emil Forsberg going to be a big time difference maker in Major League Soccer? Because I saw this and the the name, you, you start to like, you remember those games with Sweden, those moments with Leipzig, and you're like, oh my God, Emil Forsberg. Like, finally, the Red Bulls network is, is you know, flowing the opposite direction, so to speak. And Is that what you saw? Because I saw Red a Bulls. lot of Red Bulls fans who were like, oh, great. We get a big time player when Leipzig want him off their books. Well, yeah, but that, I mean... But, but that was the underlying, like, it's flowing the other direction, but also, wait, it's flowing the other direction, but why? Yeah. Is this Omer Damari again? Right. Yeah. 
Uh, good, I, good, oh, good. I think good, good one there. I've always been iffy on Forsberg as like the highest level player. Like I thought he would take steps that didn't end up happening in his career, whether I think a lot of it was with Sweden when he was outside the system of like, oh, maybe he's not as good as I thought, but he's better than a lot of players in Major League Soccer. And he's better than a lot of the players that they've signed in the past. If you put him on a field with Lukinos, Lukinos is going to be a better player. Zemil Forsberg is a good soccer player. Like he is a high level player. And the nice part is, he gets he gets the game model. He understands the system. You don't have to get him there on that. You just have to get him there on understanding Major League Soccer. The pressure that will be on him, because he will be, I think, relied on in a way even more than what he was at Leipzig, because he's the DP. Like, that's how MLS He was not a every-game starter at Leipzig. And he is often like a 60-minute player when he does play, whether it's for Sweden or Leipzig. And maybe that works out for the Red Bulls. Maybe you bring back Omir Fernandez, who's a free agent. So you have Omir, you have Lewis Morgan. But if you're any team in MLS, you should be talking to Omir For sure. Fernandez. You have Lewis Morgan, you assume, coming back? You have to believe that. Luquinhas, and then Forsberg in those two spots behind the strikers. Van Zier, Corey Burke, Tom Barlow, Elias Manuel, man of the playoffs. He is the, he's the new Dyron. Yikes. Uh Amaya, Edelman, Stroud, I guess Yearwood maybe. And then you got to figure out what you're doing at the outside back position. They were one of the best defensive teams in the league. They need to fix right back. Right back's a big one. I wouldn't trust that John Tolkien will be there the whole year. Yeah, you'd assume Tolkien is on for bigger and better things, which is great. And that's part of your club model. And they're somewhat prepared for it. They've brought Curtis Ofori through. They have a few options of Ante Mullings as well that they could push into the first team. I know they like Matthew Nosita as a center back, Hassan Endam. So they're, they're center backs. They save so much money for quality or like roster spots, international spots versus other teams. And Cornell is still one of the best in MLS. So I think the, the base is there for them. And now the hope is whether the attacking pieces are coming back healthy, you're adding Forsberg, or you're fitting it together in a system maybe that's a little bit more geared towards everything because you went from Struber to Lassane in the middle of a season. You didn't have an off season to tweak it. Your hope would be that it's more positive going forward. And I don't think we even mentioned Van Zier. Yeah. I mean, I said his name. Okay. You spent, he was like a record signing. Yeah. You need to get a lot from him or he needs to be on a different team starting next year. Who should hire Troy Lassane? Dave Clark has to start. So I wonder if Colorado's too far down the road already. Well, They've announced four finalists. Um, I think he would make a lot of sense there, especially if you he can take some of the Red Bull pressing, mix it with some more possession as he tried at altitude. I think that one's really interesting. I assume, I don't know this, that he doesn't speak French, but Montreal would make a lot of sense in terms of the success he built in New Mexico, the influence he had at Red Bull of being a team that pushes young players from your academy into the first team and sort of working not as many resources as you could. So I think those are the two big ones that stand out to me of he fits the idea of what they're looking for and the way they've gone about hiring their coaches so far. You don't think DC could be in there? I think DC would be a little bit of a different project because you've got a Benteke, you've got guys that you are like win now with, but I think he could be a good coach there. I think it would make a ton of sense. And I think it would be an interesting step for them because your hope would be he will be there for a while. Like Wayne Rooney was always short term. Right. And so much of what they've done has been short term, but so has Ben Tekke. So it doesn't feel like they're building for the future right now. Troy Sane's agent, a busy man, you assume. Is it you? Because you've already thrown him on a couple of times. I know. I'm doing my best, I guess. I'm not getting <laughs> a cut. <laughs> Chicago Fire, George Heights, Sebastian Pelzer, they're back. Four years without the playoffs, but they're back. Yeah. Joe Mansueto says, we're not changing direction here. Back as the CSO and handling this business. Looks like Frank Klopas will be back. That's a tough pill to swallow for Fire fans, man. Brian, Super Brian Gutierrez signed a five-year contract. That's, essentially. that's, Yay. you know. Here's the positive. Right. Here's the that, that's the water washing down the bitter pill of like the guys running our soccer ops haven't made the playoffs in a team in uh, well, a team that's spending enough where they should in a league that has enough playoff spots that yeah, it, it's like odds are you're gonna make one in four years. So what do you make of it? I think that Joe Mansueto looked at the soccer side of the organization and said, "There's very little here, process wise, that is good." 
And I think if you look at the results for many, many years, I understand why you would say that. Sort of bereft. He said, these guys have experience building that foundation, that process. What George Heights did at Basel is, you know, we need that in Chicago. Oh, and by the way, I have a Swiss club too in Lugano that he can sort of port some of these things over from. And Finished third last year in the Swiss Luga- League. And Lugano's doing... Currently sitting eighth. Ve- doing but well. early. Yeah, doing very, very well, at least in terms of his... Um, the expectations for a club like that. Now, that's hard for Fire fans to hear. They're like, we don't care about yeah. Lugano. Like, you shouldn't. It doesn't not matter to us what's happening over in Switzerland right now. That's just a place where we can send, you know, some of our, our failed signings, which they've actually done. <laughs> then also Mansueto's looking at it and saying, well, you did identify and sign... John Duran, and that worked out super well for us in terms of selling a player to a big-time league and elevating our profile. You did the same thing with Gagas Lanina in terms of selling him for a lot of money. We have two players that could potentially be in that same zone, and Brian Gutierrez, we've now locked him up to a long-term deal, so you would assume you can sell him at a good number if he continues to progress. Probably not in that same range as those former players, but, you know, Either sell him or you keep him as a foundational piece. And Chris Brady could be another Gaga Sunina for you. M- my feeling is that Mensueto just said, I don't see a better alternative out there. I think we're still building our processes and I trust these guys to do it. I would just say, man, the leash as far as first team results, like what are you trying to do here? How long do you need to build a process yeah. in a league in which FC Cincinnati was the worst team in the league and turned it around in one off season? Yep. How long do you need? Yeah. And with the money you've spent, because it's fair to say we're stuck in contracts. We don't want to spend money. We're not going to buy guys out. We're not going to bring in a huge DP. Ben Sueto has spent money. They have spent a lot of money on this roster, which is the roster on moving to Soldier Field. Like he is not afraid to invest in this club. No, it's and it's tough in facility that's in like a pretty prime area of the city. And it's tough in MLS to spend different than other teams because a lot of it is all homogenous, and so they've done that and they've done it poorly. And I think what you worry about is like they've missed on big time DPs in Shakiri. They've missed on MLS acquisitions in Shabilko. They've missed on young acquisitions from outside the league in Jairo Torres. There's not a lot of hits there to say, oh, but this is this is our sweet spot. This is what we're good at. What are the Maybe hits we'll here? lean in. Rafa Shihos is, is a pretty solid center back, yeah, but, but they, they, he, his salary is 1.3 million. Yeah. Like it, he should be. And he's. At the end of his career, in his prime, or in the back end of his prime, he was bought to be this player. Federico Navarro is a pretty good player. Yeah, I thought I think Miguel Angel Navarro is a good acquisition yeah. as well. Dumbia is a DP right now, but just in name only. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't know so what's going on. they have happen. a DP spot. But Gaston Jimenez, just, I mean, all the, the cap mistakes, let's say, made with Gaston Jimenez around what his status was going to be, what they had to spend to get him, how they'd extend his deal. And like, I would argue he's not, an, he's not a winning spot in your team. He does not make you better than the teams against you at whatever cap designation he's at, but especially as a designated player. I think Carlos Tehran is a pretty decent young center back. I like that signing. Obviously, Gutierrez has been good, but you've been having to push him back and forth with Shakiri and figure out the right place for him. But that goes back to Shakiri, who is the highest paid player in the league, I believe, like since the numbers went down after year one of Insigne. I think think Shakiri is number one. Which is ridiculous. I, I don't know that Kutsias has really fit in. They haven't totally trusted him. I mean, he's fine if you had, a, if you had a, a, a go-to nine that he would back up. Oh, as, well. as a backup player. Yeah. Right. And Holly Salese was a good acquisition. They made a good move and yeah, they brought like in a, one. a player who can yeah. play at the level he's kind of expected to. Um, but yeah, there's not, there's not a lot to lean on except play 11 Academy kids. Like the, I, I give them credit for giving Gaga Slonina the opportunity and then transferring that to Chris Brady and not filling that spot and saying, oh, in a year or two, it'll be Chris Brady. That's really the only spot that I give them credit. Yeah, man, it's tough. <laughs> That's tough for the fire. CF 97 forever just hit us up and said WTF. And I, I get it, man. I get it. Year after year after year, like wh- for the fire organization, where is the bright spot? Yeah. In a, in a league where there's, Suppo- you know supposedly parody and like i think cincinnati's a good one to hit on houston's a good one now to hit on we've seen it in the past with rsl we saw columbus go up down up but like movement 
And Chicago has kind of sat right there in the middle of DC alongside them. And I think it's fair for those fans to sort of wonder, how do we get to the next step? It's possible. What we're saying is there's a ton of examples that it's massively possible for Chicago to go to where they, from where they stand now to being in our convo next week about the next round of the playoffs and being an MLS cup contender. But it seems tough because the expectations don't seem to be that internally at the club. And how do you make changes on the top end of the roster? shakiri has got another year on his deal. Yep. He, he's not going anywhere. Nope. Jairo Torres is through 2025. That, he's that's... been injured a ton, which is upsetting. Hasn't been talent. He hasn't been effective when he's been on the field. You assume Dumbia is going to come off that DP spot, but given the track record on the other DPs, would you give them a... Do we bring Chicharito back around like the original convo, which before he came we to MLS, should. which was Chicago's we one should. of them? Do you think... Do you think that would – would you sign that player at, with his health and his age for this team? Can you sign better? You've spent that a number that proves you can. I don't think it would be a bad move for a couple reasons, one of which is probably because it doesn't lock you down long term. And if you've got yeah, that's fair. Shakiri, right. you're already, already sort stuck. of acknowledging that there's going to have to be a – a foundational change coming. Right. Be good for a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. And then figure Ele- it out. Elevate us in terms of we move into the Soldier Field. We're still trying to rebuild visibility in Chicago. I-, I would just say that the best way to rebuild visibility is not to be terrible. Yeah. It's not to miss the playoffs every single year. They'll get Chris Mueller back next year, yeah. which I think will help. Um, I thought Gutierrez was fantastic. I think there's other pieces in the Chicago Academy that I really like. I thought Chicago, too, was a good team this year. So, like, there's... Chicago should be a soccer hotbed. I think they've done the right thing over the last few years of leaned purely into Chicago. They should not be in Florida recruiting. They should not be in Texas or New Mexico, maybe not even Michigan. Like we're talking about one of the great soccer markets in America. And I think they figured that part out. So there's some space there. If you do bring in a Chicharito and you play out the Shakiri Chicharito error of maybe there's improvement happening behind them as that happens. But I, I do think last show we talked about Chicharito and I was like, oh, on a non-DP number, I think we should throw that conversation out. There's no chance. That he signs non-DP? Yeah. I think that's Maybe great. if there's one market with one person, maybe I'll try to choose that guy. He'll say, yeah, I'll take a TAM deal. But I just don't think we should assume Chicharito is coming somewhere with, with Chivas and Club America and Tigres and teams in the Middle East and teams in Europe in the conversation that he's taking a cut rate deal. America? I don't know. I'm just throwing out teams that have money That's where true. Chicharito could put on just, jersey and sell like a million that would be of the them. ultimate sin. But like, they have signed the Dos Santoses out of MLS. They've signed Brian Rodriguez. They've done it in the past. Yeah, but, but I get it. He's yeah, Chivas. he's Chivas. His family's Chivas. Chivas. Fine. Then that's where the money is. All right, let's talk Minnesota United. Let's go north up the lakes. Are we gonna be positive at any point in this? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, maybe not. I okay. think we'll get to that. Minnesota United in a weird state. Connor hit us up, said, should Minnesota United fans be concerned at all about the way the timeline of our newest CSO, chief soccer officer, in case you're hearing us say that and you're not connecting the dots, and future manager is going down with Khalid El Ahmad's ongoing commitments to Barnsley. Which available manager do you think the loons should per- pursue? So Khalid El Ahmad is the new CSO at Minnesota, but he won't come till the summer. And Sherry Ballard, the CEO of Minnesota United, said, we're not going to try to buy him out. It's like, that's... That's like crossing a line for us. That puts him in this weird limbo zone of not having a CSO in the building or can focus on what they're trying to do, but then they also don't have a head coach. So who's making those decisions? Ballard said this was the quote-unquote trade-off and his unknown start date. Here's the quote. It came down to choice of right candidate for our club and inconvenience of time delay or someone who could get here right now but who wasn't the absolute best choice. So what does that then mean for the manager, though? Yeah, probably means the manager is not the absolute best <laughs> choice, but I guess that's an easier one to change. I mean, look, managers we, we see it in MLS well, all year this year, and and yeah. more so recently. Like managers change, like that's not an impossibility. It's not a huge stumbling block. Like that's the profession. It can happen. It can happen quickly. Yeah, going back to what we said about Red Bull of like your CSO, and the reason we say CSO by the way is every club uses a different term. So it is who is the senior soccer. Decision maker. Sherry Ballard is the senior 
member of Minnesota United. She runs the club. She's the she's the, she's the chief executive. Yeah, but she's not making the soccer decision specifically. Although she might be in this scenario. And well, every if club. You want to, let's say who is because she she did say that short term roster decisions are going to be made by her interim technical director Hank Stebbins, interim head coach Sean McCauley, and transitioning CSO Manny Lagos, who's been in that building for a long time. Yeah, so that's why we use that term because some teams call them technical directors, GMs. Sometimes it's the president, like. Tim Bezbachenko and Garth Lagerway. There's all the, sometimes it's the head coach who also has that role. So that's why we use that term. I, think, but not Adrian Heath, not Adrian Heath. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wait. I think when you look at El Amad, you're talking about similar to the Red Bull conflict, resetting the club, long-term vision. That's the guy you want. So in accepting that, that's the soccer ideas. That's the soccer identity for the long term. And then the coaches under that, you sort of end up in a situation where, yeah, coaches maybe can be moved in and out under that person who has a bigger vision for the academy, for the club, for the two team, for the way Minnesota United is built. And I think Minnesota United has run pretty short term so far in their existence. Is this an attractive job for managers, given that they may be coming into a situation where their future CSO is not explicitly making the decision I will tell you what every coach who I talk to when I ask that question about every opening tells you. There are 29 of these, and they're all attractive if you're only getting one offer. I, I think Renoso, I think Puki, DeBossi should be fully healthy this year. Dane St. Clair, Dotson's come back. I think Robin Ludd should be back. There's a ton of talent on this team. I think it's fully reasonable to expect you can be in the playoffs before this guy comes in in July. And then it's your job to keep from that point if on. If you're winning. Why, why change things? Your hope would be there is a game model and an overall philosophy that has been sent over by El Amad saying, this is what I'm looking for. And that all of the coaches have to fit in that to at least some extent. But we don't know how he'll be involved in interviews. We don't know if he'll be allowed to talk to the candidates if he'll be in the official interview, unofficial interview, we don't know how any of that works. So yeah, it's awkward. And if I was a Minnesota United fan, I would be worried about it because a lot of it doesn't totally make sense and it isn't really set up to be super successful. But I think it's positive that Minnesota United made the assessment of how do we grow this club long-term? And I don't think they have done that in their MLS existence. I think often it has been, how do we make the playoffs? Do you think that he will, we're just all guessing here, yeah. given his experience, like give them sort of a list of guys that he likes? Because you would think that any any executive anywhere in the game always has sort of a running list of, these are the guys I like. Probably part of his interview process. Right. It was no, probably no, part no, 100%. of his presentation. He can't, come, he can't come in and they're like, well, who would you hire as coach? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. He's like, here are the guys that either I've worked with or fit my game model who are available or could be available. That would make sense here. You know what's interesting? I did not realize that he was a four-year letter winner yep. at UW Milwaukee. Go Panthers, I think. Yeah, which is like the foundational college program of essentially soccer in Minnesota. Tony Sane went there. Manny Lagos went there. I would assume that he knows all those guys pretty intimately and would I think therefore it was part be of the able to like seed his needs once yeah. desires and I think it, it was part of why he, he was the right fit which is he understands the region he understands what he's getting into of like moving here and living in Minnesota which isn't a known for a lot of people internationally and he has these soccer ideas that he has developed over in England and in Europe over his time there so I, I get you sort of can understand yeah, that, that hire like, makes right guy. sense. You're like, yeah. dang, I just wish you could yeah. you could get him before but summer. Do you think Minnesota's in a win now mode? Have to be. Do you think they should be? How could they not be? How could you not be with Reynoso like out to pasture or wherever the heck he was for half the season, but one of the best number tens in MLS? You don't know what's gonna happen with him, but you do know when he's on the field, you can win any soccer game in this league. And you just signed Tame Puki. And the whole yeah. thing with Puki was like Adrian's like, we haven't had a nine. We need a nine. We got to have a goal scorer. We get a goal scorer. We're going to be a good team. They got a goal scorer. He scored goals. They almost made the playoffs. But he got canned before that. Like, this is a win now team, no doubt about it. Mm. Where's the future? In terms of the roster? Yeah, in terms, in of, terms of, other than like maybe Bongi. 
Who were the guys? Bongi, that- Dane St. Clair, Kervin Ariaga, Rosales, Dotson. All those, all those guys are, are now guys. I don't think they're now guys. Well, they're guys that open a window that you hope continues for a few years. They're not like, hey, we'll, we'll develop you and sell you on. They're like, most of those guys are pretty much. Yeah. Pookie's the part that doesn't fit into any of this. If you are trying to change the club and develop and go forward. I don't think they are. I think they're trying to but win. The person who signed Pookie doesn't work for the team anymore. So clearly there was a disconnect at I mean, some point. I guess point. Sang Bin could be a... Yeah. A lot of this team is for the future, not the center backs. But besides I, that... I don't know about that. A lot of this team could be for the future. Or they've established that their base isn't right and, like, you're rechanging everything over the next few years. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's... I have stated very clearly, I think, that the fact that your best player who allows you to win in every game disappeared for half the season is not a reliable way to build a club. That's fair. Uh, Mayan hit us up said would be nice if you could talk about teams you think can be contenders next season if they make a few moves doesn't matter if those teams are eliminated from the playoffs or not so we're going to start this conversation by saying neither of us can take Inter Miami <laughs> like that's just blindingly obvious do you want to give reasons why? I don't need to give the case we sort of did at the top with Luis Suarez and you know the fact that Lionel Messi's there and when Messi was on the field they were quite quite good uh, I'm going to take NYCFC they're sticking with Nick Cushing because like, I think that the roster and the underlying numbers say that this team very much should have been better last year results-wise than they were. They beat your Inter-Miami on Noche de Or. Yeah, Noche, huge Noche de Or. I mean, Tyus Magno was saving his best for Noche de Or, yeah. which is tough. <laughs> tough. I like the I like Fernandez, the new, the new young signing out of Argentina. I think he's shown flashes, and he's got David Goss theorem written all over him. Uh, Santi, Martin, uh, Santi Rodriguez was very good to end the season when he came back. I'm not sure Bacrar is the only option you want to have up top, but I think they have the room to go out and sign another player. Probably would be another young player that they're trying to develop who has had some success in South America, if I was guessing. Tyus Magno was disappointing last year, but certainly has another level that he can reach. And in Sands and Parks, you have a good foundation in the uh, central midfield, and Risa and Tiago turned into a, a nice little combo at at center back as well. So it feels to me like they have the foundation to be a nailed down middle of the pack playoff team next year. Do we, is Maxi Morales coming back? I mean, he, he did his, he did his knee, didn't he? Like yeah. He's out. He's out pretty long term, I think. Okay. I was just checking. Maxi Morales feels like a guy who is going to follow the, the Javi Mo route. And I would not be surprised to see Maxi Morales one day being an assistant and perhaps being the manager yeah, of it. I you were going to say, go play for FC Dallas. No, but that was, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think your pitch is correct. I think you are right to pick NYCFC, which is the roster that they already have under contract for next year that finished this season would have made the playoffs if they were together the whole year. Yeah. That's pretty much the whole argument. There's not a ton of reason to believe a lot of these guys take step backs or get worse. So the belief is going forward. I, I think they settled on Matt Freeze as the season went along. I think that's a big one as well. Yeah, I think there's every reason to believe that they'll take a step forward. Um, the one I'm going to go with is Portland, which is a bit of a cheap one. One spot out of the playoffs. Coaching change over the course of the season. I've said a Pfizer. couple of times. Yeah, I, I don't know how Phil Neville fits in with this, but... Just purely from talent, I I, I think Evander is going to be special next year. I thought he was special this season. If he can be a little bit more consistent for you, I think you already have the first step going forward. Felipe Mora came back, gave them another option oh. at center forward. Yeah. I'm allowed to say he scored goals no, playing yeah, soccer. I, just, I wouldn't sign him as a designated I I player. Just, I just made it. I made an unintelligible noise there. Uh, I think Santi Moreno special if he's coming back. I don't know the other pieces in there. I thought this year they showed the ability to play at times without Diego Char, which isn't a thing they're going to try and consistently do, but they can. Eric Williamson should come back from injury. Fingers crossed there. But I thought Christian Paredes taking a step forward this year was massive for them because they haven't shown that they had another central midfielder. So now they have depth and options in those positions. I think they need to fix the goalkeeper position. They probably want to bring in another center back, even though we say this every single off season. We do. And I would adjust what they do at the fullback position. You don't think Araujo is going to, didn't he, seem. He might be, but then what? Zach McGraw is the other starter alongside him. Yeah. Zuparic Zupar, seemed like he wanted to leave. Yeah. So I, I think no matter what he was wh- actively saying, Hey, I, 
I don't know that they have enough depth at center back. That's, that's just it's a common just, theme, yeah. it turns out. Uh, and I have said a million times, I don't think Bravo and Mascara as a pairing at the two fullback positions is a way to win in MLS because they both both their skill sets are going forward, but they've invested a decent amount in those two. So I don't know that you can get off it, which will be interesting in like, what does Phil Neville add from a roster point of view? It feels like a pretty set team. And then from a soccer point of view, I really don't know who Phil Neville is as a head coach because we didn't really get enough time and we got no consistency at Inter-Miami. I thought Inter-Miami closed 2022 well. I thought with the pieces they had, they were extremely competitive. And so I think that's your like one glimmer of hope of where they had success. I don't know if that means he has to play five in the back. I'm not saying that, but I thought he was able to look at the players, create a setup for them to be successful and then be able to win. It was good news that Miles Joseph uh, came back on that staff just so, for some continuity. So it wasn't a brand new situation for Phil Neville to come into and just but be like, do you want continuity if you let Gio Severese go? Yeah, but I think, I do think you want familiarity with the players and with the situation and what worked at the end of the year and things definitely worked. So Phil can come in and put his own stamp on things, but he has someone there that can sort of guide him in terms of, Hey, this is an established group that has players. I think, I think Portland should be thinking we're in win now mode, given the players they have and the money they've invested. Okay. How do we get to that point where we're winning, where we're a cup contender in some way? All right, let's keep it moving here. We have uh, hit the hour mark. You always think, which is two of us. We're not going to do that much. Nice. Right? Yeah. Is Richie Larea worth a DP spot for the Caps? Word is that perhaps to keep him from Nottingham Forest, they would have to make him their third DP. Was he worth it? I think the roster is built in a way in which you can make him a DP and still contend. Is he worth it? I, I don't know how to place that question in the wording. I would say for Vancouver and the way they're set up, Richie Larea can be a winning player for them. and what it looks like their roster situation is and their salary cap situation is yes, they can fit him in there and be competitive and continue to get better as a club. You would hope that there would be a path to buy it down. Yeah. Um, that I think that would be crucial, like just to keep pushing the roster forward as well. But you know, it probably depends on the, on the transfer fee that's being asked for, for Richie from Forrest. So, okay. Galaxy have two DP spots. Do you think they'll fill them both in the summer? In the summer. Sorry, in the uh, in the winter. winter. Yeah, probably. Because Greg Vanny's there. What, well, and the pressure is. You, yeah, maybe maybe it's a high. signing of someone who will come in the summer when their season is up. But my assumption would be you go into the season with those two acquisitions made. I have no idea what type of player it will be. They have been of all. Uh, you go from Cabral to Douglas Costa. Like those are the two extremes at the same position that do not fit in any way in the same like idea of what your club is. So I don't know who they will try and put so, into these. Okay, spots. let's so try. Let's plot this out here. You have a ten. I, you know, since Billy Sharp's not coming back, you obviously need a DP nine. I think you got to sign a forward. Jovic has proven that he is not that guy to be the starter. He's a great option off the bench, but I don't. Is Greg Vanny vindicated for not starting Jovic all that time? Or is he on the bad side of this? Cause I think he signed Jovic. A little bit of both. Yeah. Because when he signed Jovic, it was pretty clear that it was the backup teacher. Yeah. Which was a smart move. And hopefully develop into. Sure. It, sure. Sure. But not to be pushed into that position. Like you would have still expected Chicharito to be, you know, what he was last year. Last year is a long time away. Now I should probably say in 2022 instead of last year. So, okay, forward. And then you're probably, again, looking at a winger. <laughs> again. <laughs> going back to the well. Because Tyler Boyd, you don't know if he's coming back. You did trade for Diego Fagundes. And then Barrios is gone. Costa is gone. Do you think that for most of the season, Mark Delgado and Gaston Brugman are starters? I mean, if they're healthy, yeah. Well, that's Gaston Brugman towards meniscus at the end of the year. Yeah, so... So probably no. So then I, I bet more on Marky, but so then I think you would sign a central midfielder. You wouldn't sign a winger. No, because I think that with Ricky Fug can elevate with Fagundes in the team and with what Ricky does well, I think you elevate your team more and having cover for him and a connection for him in midfield to allow him to consistently be that attacker with your DP nine. You have Fagundes a type and then you thing. figure out the other side. Yeah. And again, that's what I would do. Also, it protects your back line, which we don't know if that's going to get any better. Yeah, but Maya Yoshida's training with Southampton. Is he? Yes. 
Because he's going to play for Southampton? No, no, Why does he have to train in the offseason? He's a professional. I like that. Man's a pro. I respect it. Yeah. Uh, let's, who's let's Billy see. Sharp training with? I don't, that's a good question. He's probably still chilling in LA. I hope he is. Hope he's enjoying his life. Uh, your take on the, well, we did the one position. Nathan Hill asked us the one position FC Dallas could focus on to improve in the offseason. We said nine to let Jesus Ferrer be in the best possible position. I didn't say that, but yeah. Is that you? I don't think it matters. I think you sign the best player at wing or nine that you can, and oh, okay. Jesus can play the other thing yeah, yeah, and do the other stuff. Anyway, go listen to the last show. Jared yeah. also asked, if Nico Ladero doesn't stay with the Sounders, how might he fit into other MLS teams? You suggested Nashville, I believe. I love the Nashville. On the last show. Yeah. Do you? I might be the only one who likes that. No, I like it, but it just seems like a continuation for Nashville of like relying on older central midfielders to be the to be the thing after Hani that maximizes their potential and that, that but aren't they in win now mode they are for sure in win now mode but that so just feels that a win now move it is without mortgaging your future so what you just you're replacing Dax probably with Nico is that no I think you would play the diamond he would be at the point he would be the attacking player right and then you would have so you have Dax you have Godoy and you have let's just say what they did this year wheel, wheel and then you uh, it takes pressure off Hani to drop in and create but Nico works hard, so I think he will fit into Gary Smith's team. He's a free kick taker as well. Maybe that takes some of that pressure off Hani. He can be a goal scorer coming out of that midfield spot. I think it makes you better in the same setup that they're already in. I'm trying to think of another team that would that where where I think Nico would conceivably want to go. I have that one would work for Orlando. Nico. Orlando? If Pereira's if, if Mauricio Pereira. yeah, is done. It would be a very like for like swap, but it would be a uh, Faku Torres one more year, Ojeda one more year. We think we're close. How do we stay? And I think Oscar, we made the joke about Javi Mo in the past. He's tried to find a, you know an extra year or two out of a guy who's already been in MLS and had success in MLS to see if he can sort of get a little bit more. So I think that's one that could make mis- make sense. Plus, you get to move to Florida. You get to go back. You get to go to warm. You know, you're an old person. That's what you do. <laughs> He's younger than both of us. Oh, God. Uh, did anyone else stand out or that's it? No, I think those are the only two for me. I mean, anybody would be like, oh, let's kick the tires on Nico. Yeah. It just depends on what number he wants to go for. And yeah. that seems to be the issue with him and the Sounders as well. Yeah. Where they're like, hey, we, we would do it this number. And he's like, that's not in my that's not in my my galaxy right now. No. But oh. it seems like they're they have negotiated publicly in the past. Let's just say. True. So that that may be a continuation. All right, I think you know what I think. Let's call it good, man. Okay. On the schedule today at Major League Soccer, apparently we're getting massages after this. James Paul Perez tweeted and said, "Weeby, I also got to travel to Portugal this year. Amazing country. Why is there not more of a pipeline of Americans into Liga Portugal? Too similar in MLS quality? Because you're the Portugal guy. Ah, uh, you're the Portugal guy. Oh, no, you're the no, Portugal no, no, guy. No, 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 no. I, I was just following your recommendations. Nice. I asked you where James to go Paul Perez. I would say one great trip. Two, I think Portugal has such a close connection already soccer wise with especially Brazil yeah. and other places where the numbers they're willing to spend is not high enough to buy MLS players. We kind of saw the issue with Reggie Cannon. And so you get in a weird place where you want oh, to buy, but you have to deliver us the money. Yeah. Movies. And a lot of Americans and Canadians go there as young free agents to try and develop their careers to take that step. But it is not normally profitable for an MLS team to sell a player there. So that would be the answer. How is, uh, how's our boy from Orlando doing there? Gosh, why can't I remember his name uh, right now? Brian Roches? No, no, that's that's before. Oh, uh, you're talking about um, Benji? Yeah, yeah, Benji, Benji Michelle. Michelle. I think he was playing a little bit. I don't remember. Let's find out. This is a good end of the show. This, this is a is, great end to the show. This is riveting. Yeah. Ah, uh, not really getting a, bun, a, a much run this year. At, name the club. Uh, where's he at? Where's he at? Where's he at? I already at? read it. And I can't say it, so I'm trying to make you do it. Arauca? Zero idea. Well. I'm sure Eric Krakauer is going to love that. That was fitting. Uh, fitting into this show. Thank you so much for everybody who hit us up with some mail. We're going to enjoy our weekend. In my case, try to, to get this immune system rolling along. I hope you're okay. I already feel sick. Dave, I've been I've been. I already feel sick. To the right, so that should be good. And we'll see you on Monday to preview the conference semifinals in Major League Soccer going out on November 25th and 26th. Adios. Enjoy your weekend, everybody.